Hello, I'm Rob Satloff, the Siegel Executive Director of the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. To our friends here in Washington, where I am, across the Middle East and around the world, welcome to this special Middle East-focused commemoration of International Holocaust Remembrance Day. We meet today at a time of terrible tragedy, terrible human tragedy, in a region that is known far too much suffering. One cannot but be moved at the images of death and destruction. One cannot but hope that the war comes to a swift conclusion. One cannot but wish for peace and reconciliation to replace hatred, violence, and conflict. We need to acknowledge at the outset the profound human suffering, the suffering of innocent Israelis, the suffering of innocent Palestinians. That is the context for today's event. And to address this question, why, against this background, should we meet in this Zoom webinar today to observe International Holocaust Remembrance Day? The answer I offer is this. Precisely because of the tragic regional circumstances, precisely because of the hatred, violence, and conflict in the Middle East today, how could we not pause to fulfill our responsibility as global citizens to remember the Holocaust? Are we supposed to allow the advocates of hate to have a veto on our moral responsibility to join with people around the world in recalling the horrors of the Holocaust, the effort to systematically kill every Jew in Europe, but whose lessons are universal, an event out of whose, acid, out of whose ashes came the concept of international human rights and was born the very word, genocide. For each of the last two years, the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum was proud to convene Holocaust remembrance events in both Cairo and Abu Dhabi. This year, it is more difficult to hold in-person events, but we have overcome that obstacle with this online program, drawing on participants from across the region in this webinar format. Our goal is the same as in years past, but it is even more timely and urgent given current circumstances to remember the victims of the Holocaust and reaffirm that the Holocaust will be forever a warning to all people of the dangers of anti-Semitism, racism, and all forms of group-targeted hatred. One more opening thought before we begin the rest of today's program. We have seen in recent months the phenomenon of the politicization of the Holocaust by advocates of various views and positions. Of course, this isn't new. Use and abuse of the Holocaust to advance political aims has a long and mostly sordid, regrettable history. But just because we have condemned it before doesn't mean we shouldn't condemn it again now. And condemn it we do. Regardless of one's politics, no one does any favors to the important work of Holocaust awareness and Holocaust education especially in Arab societies, by weaponizing the Holocaust for political benefit. And we reject it. Let us focus on the history and its meaning today without devaluing that history by making it an asset in some cause. If all we do today is make progress toward that goal, today's event will have been worthwhile. With that, I'm very 
proud to turn the program over to my great partner, Ted Stanky, the William and Sheila Konar Director of International Educational Outreach at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, and a committed campaigner for teaching, learning, and understanding about the Holocaust around the world. Tad. Thank you, Rob. And on behalf of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, DC, I would like to welcome all of you to this special event in commemoration of International Holocaust Remembrance Day, 2024. And I'm particularly pleased to welcome some of our friends and partners from the Middle East and North Africa, where, as Rob mentioned, we've had the honor to co-host several Holocaust remembrance events in recent years. And while the ongoing tragedy in the region is of great concern to all of us, we believe that the lessons of the Holocaust are more relevant than ever. The abuse of Holocaust history to promote hatred and extremism is on the rise. And it's our duty collectively to confront this wherever we see it. The United Nations General Assembly designated January 27th as an annual day of commemoration to honor the 6 million Jewish victims of the Holocaust and millions of other victims of Nazism. So it's worthwhile to pause and ask ourselves, why do we remember this horrific event, a watershed in human history? Two years ago, the UN reaffirmed that the Holocaust is a warning of the dangers of hatred, bigotry, racism, and prejudice. And it urged all member states to develop educational programs to teach future generations the lessons of that history. This is also our mission. In Washington, the mission of our museum, to educate about how and why the Holocaust happened, including the role and dangers of anti-Semitism and group targeted hate. Anti-Semitism has a long history rooted in conspiracy theories that are attractive to individuals and movements with diverse motives. Anti-Semitism has often been used as a tool and especially in this moment where social media and assaults on truth pervade our culture. So we're here today to honor the lives of the one third of the world's Jews murdered by the Nazis and their collaborators, as well as the millions of others persecuted and the thousands who chose to help. And in doing so, we both commemorate this tragic history and reflect on the lessons it holds. After all, it wasn't only a small group of committed ideologues who were responsible for the Holocaust. The Nazis needed the assistance and acquiescence of millions of others to carry out their murderous ideology. Developing effective strategies to prevent extreme ideologies from taking root remains vitally important today. Holocaust history also encourages us to reflect on the stories of those who chose to help, often by not giving in to the opportunities and temptations to betray their fellow human beings. And one of our museum historians will be talking later about a particularly notable example. So the lessons of the Holocaust have never been more relevant, not only on this one day of commemoration, but throughout the year. I'd like to thank again our participants and our viewers, and I turn the floor back to you, Rob. Thank you very much, Ted. 15 years ago, I wrote a book called Among the Righteous, Lost Stories from the Holocaust's Long Reach into Arab Lands. The basic uh, theme of the book was to tell um, the history of what happened in Arab countries during the Holocaust with a special focus on those Arabs who protected, rescued, or saved Jews facing persecution. The lesson I came away with from that history is very simple. Everyone had a choice. Everyone had a choice to be a perpetrator, to be a bystander, or to be a rescuer. Some choices were difficult, but everyone had the opportunity to make a choice. 
Today, people make a choice too. And I'm really delighted and honored that three friends from across the Middle East who have made a choice are with us today to join in this program. Three remarkable leaders, people who have taken a firm stand against hate and extremism, people who have planted a flag for tolerance, understanding, and peace firmly in the soil of their countries and the broader region. First, I'm going to turn to Dr. Ali Rashid al um, uh, the chairman of the Defense Affairs, Interior and Foreign Affairs Committee of the United Arab Emirates Federal National Council and a leading international expert on extremism and education. Then moving uh, westward, um, beginning in Abu Dhabi, we'll then move to Jerusalem, where I'm, we'll be delighted to turn the program over to Professor Mohammed Dejani, the founder and executive director of the Wasatiya movement and a leading voice for moderation in the Muslim world. And then um, in a pre-recorded video, we'll move to the far west of the Middle East North Africa region, where El Mekti Budra, the president and founder of the Mumuna Association, an organization of young Muslim Moroccans committed to embracing the Moroccan Muslim Jewish historic cooperation, will join us to talk about the lessons of that experience. So, first, Dr. Ali Rashid Al Nuaymi. Well, Thank you very much, Rob. And uh, I'd like to thank all our colleagues who, who made this happen, actually. It's an honor for me to participate in such an event, uh, which is, I consider it uh, a human event, especially during the tragedy that we have now uh, in our region. First, you know, many sometimes question, do we need to remember the Holocaust? you know, something that happened eight years ago. And I heard this from many people. And I can answer this question by a, a question also. Did we learn the lesson that we should learn as human being from the event that happened eight years ago? Did we understand actually what hate can lead to, you know, the suffering of people because of their religion, killing six million innocent people based on ideology of hate. That, did we learn the right lesson from it? Uh, I urge everyone actually uh, to read the book. It is by one of the Holocaust survivor, Eddie Jaco. The book is about, uh, the name of the book actually, The Happiest Man on Earth. I urge everyone to read this book when you want to know about the Holocaust and when you want to understand where hate can lead us to. Especially, you know, you don't take things for granted when dealing with different community, which is diverse community. In this book, Eddie mentioned that his neighbor who went to school with him, who used to play, play with him, who used to be his friends, actually, you have used to have lunch, dinners, play with them. You know, they were the closest to him in his school, in the playground, in the neighborhood. They turned because of the narrative of hate. At that time, against Jews, suddenly they were his enemy because of the hate. And this is where, you know, we, we talked many times that never again, we don't want such a thing that happened to the 6 million Jews to happen again to any human being. But unfortunately, sadly, it's happening again and again. Because of what? Because of hate. And this is why the question, did we learn the right lesson? Is there any lesson that we should convert these lessons to initiatives, programs, you know, that will bring people to 
close to each other that will build bridges of trust, respect, and love between different component of any community? Do, do we actually work based on initiatives to counter hate and promote coexistence and love within this community? Unfortunately, the answer is no. What I see, especially during the tragedy that we have, we are having in our region, the suffering, as Rob mentioned in his introduction, of innocent Israeli and innocent Palestinian, we see the hate narrative is is all over the world. You see it everywhere, and you know you don't know where this hate narrative will lead us. The rise of anti-Semitism in, 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 in the European University, in the cities, in the, in the United States, everywhere. You see it now on the rise. Why? We have to answer this question. How can people, you know, be targeted because of their religion or their ethnic or their color or their nationality? What should, where, 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 where did we fail? What should we do or what kind of measure, preventive measure that we should have taken, especially leaders in these countries, you know, to prevent such a thing? I believe that we are facing a huge challenge. And we, uh, all of us, it's a, it's a common responsibility. We have to have the courage to come forward, to counter hate based on prevention, engaging everyone, showing them that hate will lead us nowhere. You know, when a community accepts a, a hate narrative against any of its components, at the end, the whole community will suffer. And this is what we see now uh, in our region, and we, we're, we see it also globally. So when you accept a hate narrative against anyone, later on, it will come back to you. We should create, you know, a community everywhere that share respect, love, acceptance of each other, regardless of us. We shouldn't accept any hate narrative against any component of any community. If we do so, at the end, we will suffer. This is why it's very important. Rob, you mentioned, you know, uh, a very important issue, actually. When you talk about, you know, we, when we deal with the Holocaust, we shouldn't play politics with it. It's not a political issue at all. When we pl play politics with these things and when we let politicians use this issue that promote hate, you know, at the end, all of us will suffer. We should be firm that when it comes to what brings us together as humanity, the human value, we should fight for this. We should have the courage to engage and counter all those who will promote hate. And this is where, you know, Europe and United States, the West is well developed in many areas. But when it's come to anti-Semitism or, you know, anti-other, groups or religion or Islamophobia, we see a failure. It's related to culture. It's related to a failure of the educational system. It's, it's a failure of politicians who use some of these issues related to hate narrative to play politics to save their political agenda. It's very important that we should be firm about this. We shouldn't let any politician, you know, to use religion or a certain an ethnic group or issue related to colors that you know actually we are we we have to live with our differences we shouldn't use these differences to divide us by politician we shouldn't let them do that and this is why it's very important for everyone when dealing with the holocaust that you have to understand the real failure that we accepted someone to promote hate within our community. And also we let politicians play that game to save an agenda. And this is where it's very important to deal with the Holocaust. 
as 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 if it is not only uh, a Jewish issue. No, it's a human issue. All of us shouldn't accept any such a things that will happen to any human being, regardless of their religion, their ethnic, their nationality, their color. And this is where we have to engage in promoting coexistence. And this is actually what we are striving to do in the UAE, where we want to show the added value of living with our differences. We want to show the added value of respecting each other. We want to show the added value of living with our differences and accepting other, uh, others as they are without asking them to change. We in the UAE, we are enjoying this, what we call a human values that bring us together. Thank you, Rob. Thank you very much, Dr. Ali. Uh, and now, uh, Professor Dijani, Mohammed. Thank you. Uh, dear friends, usually solemn occasions dictate that people remain silent. Sorry. Uh, Usually solemn occasions dictate that people remain silent, but this somber moment in instead calls upon us to make our voices heard. It's an occasion to declare a firm commitment to combat anti-Semitism and promote Holocaust awareness to honor the memories of the vanquished during the Holocaust, Jews and non-Jews. The Holocaust was a horrible chapter in human history not ever to be forgiven or forgotten. According to the Stockholm Declaration of 2000, the Holocaust or Shoah is considered the classic destruction of human beings in its scope, scale, and, and goal. So meticulously organized, so vicious, and so extensive were the policies of and attempts by German Nazi regime to exterminate and obliterate the Jewish people that a new term was coined to describe it, genocide. But why are we gathered here today? Why honor the memory of the Shoah now? This is not a trivial question and it should not be taken for granted that the, that the answer is clear to others. It puzzled my students who joined me on a trip to visit Nazi death concentration camps in Poland in March 2014. In the introduction to his book, The Sunflower, Holocaust Survival, uh, Simon Wiesenthal suggests an answer. He asserts that Holocaust remembrance is vital since schools and parents would fail to educate children on the Holocaust through their silence or denial. He affirms that this reality necessi necessitates active memorialization of the Holocaust and that the new generation has to hear what the older generation refuses to tell it. I experienced this refusal firsthand when the news that a Palestinian professor took his students on a trip to visit the Nazi death concentration camps to teach them about the Holocaust, many Palestinians and Arabs criticized and protested the trip some labeled me a traitor and collaborator, crowning me king of normalization, a derogatory term created to demonize peacemakers, building bridges, demolishing walls, and smashing taboos. Their hostile attitude and harsh reaction strengthened my conviction of the need for the world to wake up and learn about the Holocaust and have this genocide included in the educational curriculum, political rhetoric, and social events. There are many reasons why it is crucial, even essential, that memorials of the Holocaust should continue to be held even amid wars and conflict. Holocaust memorialization inspires us to contemplate tolerance, acceptance, and peaceful coexistence. It guides us on a soul-searching journey to modify our thinking patterns, cleanse our hearts, and strengthen moral positions, even when, when unpopular. 
guiding us to choose the uncharted road of moderation, reconciliation, and peace. For generations, Arab students have been denied this opportunity to learn both about the Holocaust, but also about Jewish literature, art, history, culture, and faith more broadly. This is the case even though the Holy Quran considers Judaism one of the three heavenly religions. In his book, Neighboring Faiths, David Nuremberg uh, maintains that Christianity, Judaism, and Islam are usually treated as distinct religions. Yet, throughout their histories, these three religions have developed an interaction. His book aims to help comprehend the interwined past of the three faiths as a way for their heirs to produce the future together. Although Arabs revere the study, writing, and teaching of history, and have produced numerous famous historians, they keep ignoring the history of the Holocaust and the deeply rooted European anti-Semitism that caused it. Not only do history teachers neglect to teach about the Holocaust, but teachers of social sciences, politics, international relations, psychology, and other subjects have also expunged this essential topic from their syllabi. The few who mention it usually do so to minimize or deny it, claiming the facts are exaggerated, the victims were not Jews, or it happened during a war and ended while the, while the 1948 Nakba was still ongoing. Meanwhile, public references to the Holocaust are often warped through a perverted prism of popular culture from the ranting of religious extremists and distortions of specific satellite television channels to the writings of many alien-formed authors and Holocaust deniers. This is the wrong road to be taken. When the Arab world listened to US President Barack Obama speaking from Cairo in June 2009, respectfully reciting verses from the Holy Quran and proclaiming US endorsement of a two-state solution to achieve a durable Israeli-Palestinian peace, few seemed to notice that he also condemned Holocaust denial. Trying to create awareness on such topics among Palestinians and Arabs is an uphill battle, especially given the violent conflict at hand. However, without learning about the Holocaust, discussing other genocide or even the, the Palestinian Nakba is futile. I have attempted to take the task on as an educator and peacemaker. I passed on the motivating lessons I learned throughout my journey to my students. I learned from Socrates that walking alone in the right direction, guided by my convictions, is better than walking with the crowd in the wrong direction. While the crowd might demonize and ostracize you, the freedom gained by the casting away the chains of the past to move on to a better future is worth it. Plato's allegory of the cave taught me the need to seek education and knowledge. I learned from Aristotle the, the virtue of justice consists in moderation as regulated by wisdom. Nelson Mandela taught me that one should not remain a silent bystander when evil projects itself, even if the cost is high. I learned from various religions, love thy neighbor. These lessons guided me in my Holocaust education trip. Holocaust remembrance also has a message for the present as it emphasizes the moral duty to seek, pursue, and work for peace, justice, and truth. Our commemoration of the Holocaust underscores the notion that peace between our conflicting Abrahamic people is attainable and it reminds us of the value of truth. When truth is denied or ignored, it destroys those values we cherish. 
It reaffirms that Holocaust denial and distortion are historically incorrect and morally deplorable. Remembering the tragic, the tragic lesson of the past is necessary to avoid its recurrence in the present and future. Without remembering evil, we cannot appreciate the value of good. In remembrance, we express sympathy and compassion for the suffering of human beings, even if no national bond, religious affiliation, or family relation binds us. Expressing empathy and respect for the Holocaust victims is not only a tribute to the past, but also a way of diminishing racism, bigotry, prejudice, and intolerance in the present and future. As such, the Holocaust should not be politicized, linked to, or compared with other genocides, nor should its commemoration be avoided due to violent political events or current wars. Remembering the world of evil will challenge us to work for the world of good. As Simon Wiesenthal noted, for evil to flourish, it only requires good men to do nothing. I pledge not to be indifferent when anti-Semitic acts are committed or the Holocaust is ignored or denied. Thank you for honoring me to speak on this sorrowful, sorrowful occasion. Let me conclude with Martin Luther King Jr.'s inspiring words. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that. Uh, during, the, during the war of Gaza, this occasion compelled me to add ignorance cannot drive out ignorance. Only knowledge can. Violence cannot drought, drive out violence. Only nonviolence can. Despair cannot drive out despair. Only hope can. War cannot drive out war. Only peace can. Let us look forward to a new dawn that will have our sad memories behind. May God have mercy on the souls of all innocent victims of genocide. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mohammed. Um, uh, that was uh, very moving and powerful. Uh, we'll now turn to a um, a taped message from Mehdi Budra. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I want to thank the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum and Dr. Robert Satloff for including me in this outstanding panel with prominent voices as Dr. Anuaimi and Professor Dajani. On this solemn day, we will urge everyone to remember the Holocaust as one of the dark chapters of human history, which resulted in the murder of six million Jews, as well as millions of other members of minorities. The Holocaust will always serve as a warning to all people about the perils of prejudice, bigotry, racism, and hatred. On this occasion in Morocco, we will remember the late King Mohammed V, who risked his throne to save the Moroccan Jewish community from the Nazi clones. Ladies and gentlemen, despite some fluctuations in tensions that have marked the relation between Jews and Muslims in North Africa, in Morocco, Jews and Muslims have historically enjoyed a relatively peaceful coexistence. At the time of the Holocaust in Europe, Morocco constituted the largest Jewish community in the Muslim world and the largest non-Ashkenazi community with more than 250,000 Jews. Before Vichy took power in Morocco, Morocco opened its door to Jews escaping from Nazis and their allies from 1933 to 1944. Thousands of European Jews were allowed to enter Morocco and settle primarily in Tangiers, who became a haven for Jewish refugees. Many children, adults, could enter Tangiers thanks to a few international diplomats, like the American Rives Childs, who helped more than 500 Jews to enter the city from Hungary. Ladies and gentlemen, in Morocco, the Vichy government enforced harsh measures on Jews. Many Jewish students were forced to quit French schools. Many professions were forbidden or had quotas to Jews. 
Moroccan Jews were not allowed to live in European neighborhoods, but to return back to the Malah. Muslims also suffered from discrimination in many ways from the Vichy government. Moroccan natives were treated differently than European ruling elite, which furthered their solidarity with the Jews. For example, Muslims and Jews were not allowed to go to public swimming pools where Europeans were swimming. King Mohammed V expressed on many occasions his support to his Jewish subjects against the Vichy regime. As a French telegram retrieved by Haim Zafarani from May 1941, the official telegram stated that Mohammed V refused to apply Vichy laws in Morocco. Ladies and gentlemen, today Holocaust education is an important step to combat hate speech and xenophobia. His Majesty King Mohammed VI has openly recognized the Holocaust in 2009 in a message addressed to the Aladdin Project at UNESCO in Paris. He called upon the world to recognize the Holocaust as one of the dark chapters of human history. Morocco has understood that in life nothing is granted, and hate speech is the basis of any genocide. Under His Majesty King Mohammed VI leadership, Morocco has preserved dozens of synagogues around Morocco. Morocco has integrated the Judeo-Moroccan history into the Moroccan school's curriculum. The local Jewish communities, with the full support of the Moroccan government, has preserved more than 167 Jewish cemeteries and shrines in all Morocco. In 2020, in Asawira, His Majesty the King Mohammed VI has integrated by Dakira, the House of Memory, a center dedicated to the historic convivencia between Jews and Muslims in Morocco. Today, Association Mimuna work is part of a larger movement of individual initiative by civil society organization, media representative and educators to follow the steps of His Majesty the King Mohammed VI. Association Mimuna has organized in 2011, in partnership with USNGO Kivunim, the first conference of the Holocaust in the Arab world. In 2014, we organized a conference at the Tangier American Legation on Jewish refugees in Tangier during World War II. We have organized also, together in partnership with the United Nations Information Center since 2016, for commemoration of the International Holocaust Remembrance Day. Last January, in partnership with the United Nations Information Center and the Jewish community, the Mimun Association organized the commemoration at the largest synagogue of Casablanca. Almost 400 guests, including university students, Morocco's Minister of Education, Shakib bin Moussa, diplomats from the US, Israel, France, Poland, Germany, the Vatican and Spain, as well as representatives from Moroccan civil society and international organizations packed the pubes to honor the victims of the Holocaust as well as the actions of late King Mohammed V. On another hand, we have been working with the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum since 2016. Our members and teachers have benefited from the trainings provided by the museum in Morocco and the US. In partnership with the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, we created the first Arabic language Holocaust curriculum by and for Muslims. Ladies and gentlemen, Last but not least, I want to thank the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum for bringing us together for this meaningful event. Now more than ever, it is essential to remember the lessons of the Holocaust to counter the spread of hate and bigotry. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, El Mehdi Boudreau. Um, and again, I want to extend my gratitude to all of our friends uh, from Rabat to Jerusalem to Abu Dhabi, who spoke so eloquently and powerfully today. Uh, during these uh, Holocaust Remembrance events, it's important to take a moment to do learning, to take a moment to delve into a piece of what happened so that we can um, emerge from this event, as Muhammad said a moment ago, with a bit of deeper knowledge. Um, uh, knowledge is, of course, empowering. And so today, um, we take special note of the 80th anniversary, just this week, of the creation by President Roosevelt of the War Refugee Board, the first official effort by any government to protect the citizens of other countries from the ravages of racial, religious, 
or ethnic-based persecution. To discuss the War Refugee Board, I'm very happy to introduce a video with Dr. Rebecca Erbelding, a historian at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum and author of the definitive work, Rescue Board, the untold story of America's effort to save the Jews of Europe. Hello, my name is Rebecca Rebelding, and I'm a historian. As we commemorate International Holocaust Remembrance Day, we also mark the 80th anniversary of the creation of the War Refugee Board, a United States government agency tasked with trying to rescue and provide relief for Jews and other persecuted minorities during the Holocaust. The creation of the War Refugee Board was a long time coming. During the 1930s, even though Americans could read in their local newspapers about the growing Nazi persecution of Jews, most Americans and their government wanted to stay isolated from the rest of the world. The United States was not a military superpower, and most people wanted to stay out of any kind of war or conflict overseas. The country had very strict immigration quotas, limiting the number of people who could come to the United States each year and where they could come from. Immigration laws were based in false racial theories that claimed that some nationalities were biologically superior to others. As Nazi Germany expanded territorially, and as their actions against European Jews grew more violent, the United States accepted Jewish refugees, but they made no move to expand immigration beyond the small quotas. Aid organizations did a tremendous amount of work to help people navigate the immigration system and find jobs and homes once they got here. But the United States and the Roosevelt administration prioritized recovery from the Great Depression and after Europe went to war in 1939, supporting the allies rather than pushing to change laws to accept more immigrants. Most Americans did not want more immigrants, especially if those immigrants were Jewish. It took a long time for the United States to realize that mass murder had begun and that Nazi Germany had a plan to murder all of Europe's Jews. Finally, in November 1942, the State Department concluded a brief investigation and revealed that the Nazis had a plan and had already murdered more than two million Jews. That was the same month that the Allied forces landed in North Africa as part of Operation Torch. So the United States, Great Britain, the Soviet Union, and the other allies made no promise to try to rescue Jews. They thought it didn't seem feasible. And so they condemned the crimes and said that they would hold war crimes trials after the war to punish the perpetrators. For more than a year after that, for all of 1943, more and more information reached the United States about the Holocaust and there was more and more pressure and interest in trying to do something, no one was quite sure what, but trying to do something to help. At this point, the United States Treasury Department got involved. They had been in charge of the US sanctions program, and they wanted to start sending humanitarian aid to Jewish communities through the sanctions. But the State Department kept blocking the aid, claiming that it might fall into the hands of the Nazis. When the Treasury Department kept investigating, they discovered that State Department officials had instructed American diplomats to stop sending information about the Nazi crimes to the United States. If Americans don't have that information, the State Department officials assumed, they won't pressure the government to take action. The Treasury Department was furious about this, and they wrote a report laying out their evidence. In the report, they asked whether State Department officials could be considered war crimes, uh, war criminals for their actions, and they argued that the reputation of the Roosevelt administration and the United States was at stake. They met with President Roosevelt, and he agreed. On January 22, 1944, Franklin Roosevelt signed an executive order creating a war refugee board, removing the issue from the State Department's control and announcing a new government policy of rescue and relief. The Treasury Department staff was mostly in charge of carrying out this new policy, and they did a lot over the next year. By the end of the war, they estimated that they had saved tens of thousands of lives and helped hundreds of thousands of people. They began a psychological warfare campaign, 
sending leaflets and radio broadcasts into enemy territory, warning the Nazis and their collaborators that the Allies were going to win the war and that they would be punished for their crimes. They allowed millions of dollars of humanitarian aid into Europe, which was used to buy guns for the underground movements, to pay off border guards, to buy food for children in hiding, and to pay for the creation of false identification papers. They opened a refugee camp in New York, bringing about a thousand mostly Jewish refugees to live there, in part to convince other countries to also allow Jews over their borders and into their territories. They placed representatives in some of the neutral nations, including Switzerland, Sweden, and Turkey. And those representatives worked with the governments there to protest the Nazi treatment of Jews, to pass on intelligence, and to influence them to take more humanitarian action. When Germany occupied Hungary in March 1944, the War Refugee Board tried to save Jews in, in the capital of Budapest. They sent Swedish businessman Raoul Wallenberg, who you can see seated at a desk here, to run a rescue operation there. He and the other diplomats from neutral nations opened safe houses and issued protective papers, saving tens of thousands of lives in Budapest during the occupation. And the War Refugee Board provided American citizens with detailed information about the Nazi crimes at Auschwitz. This led to an editorial in the Washington Post entitled genocide, which introduced Americans to a newly created word for this kind of crime. The War Refugee Board's work is important to remember and to commemorate. First, it's crucial to acknowledge that the United States could have done much more to aid European Jews, especially in the 1930s when it was clear that the threat was real, but before mass murder had begun. America could have protested the Nazi actions more, they could have pushed for more immigration and extended more aid. It took a long time for the United States to take action. The War Refugee Board's work and their success in saving lives, however small in comparison to the horror of the Holocaust, reminds us of the importance of humanitarian action and that it is never too late to try to do the right thing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rebecca. It is never too late to do the right thing. That is certainly one of the most important lessons from uh, remembering the Holocaust. Um, so thank you to all of our colleagues. I'm now going to turn to Mina Abdul Malik, uh, a native of Egypt and the Arabic Outreach Program Manager at the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum to close today's program. Mina. Thank you so much, Rob. Um... For so many years now, we've been working in the MENA region with amazing partners. Uh, we have some of them uh, on the screen to then our event today um, to that we all share the same um, same goal um, that we are driven from the same uh, motivation that we would confront extremism and, and hatred. Um, to try to promote the universal lessons of the Holocaust, um, which one of the darkest chapters in our human story, collective human story. Um, as we wish to see the end of the ongoing tragedy in the Middle East, and inshallah, we'll see you in person uh, in the Middle East for our next uh, uh, International Holocaust uh, commemoration. Um, we want to thank you. Um, today uh, and uh, special thanks on behalf of the Holocaust Museum, special thanks to uh, Dr. Ali Noaimi, uh, Dr. Mohammed Dijani and Dr. Rab Satlop and Mahdi Boudra. Um, and thank you all for joining us today uh, and we conclude our program.